50 years ago, a flame burned here when the Olympics came to Mexico City and the world was on fire. It was the deadliest year of the Vietnam War. Two American leaders were assassinated. Rebellion engulfed North America and Europe. And many lived in fear that the Cold War would ignite something far worse. So then here, the world came together even as it was tearing at the seams. And the Mexico City Olympics were born of a violent and relentless year. Three, two, one, happy new year! President of the United States. I report to you that our country is challenged at home and abroad. It was Tet. The Viet Cong attacked every major city in South Vietnam. I shall not speak, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. All over America, black ghettos exploded in rage and grief. In Paris, there were 400 casualties among the demonstrators. Now let's go on to Chicago and let's win there. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Oh, my God. The boycott is on. If white people want to believe it, beautiful. If they don't, that's beautiful too. What would they have to do for you to go to Mexico? The boycott is still on. The boycott is still on. And Russia and her Warsaw Pact allies have sent troops and tanks into Czechoslovakia. The rebelling Mexico City students threatened the Olympic Games, and the government sent troops. There's a statue on the campus of San Jose State University of two men who were part of the greatest track and field team ever assembled at a games that changed the Olympics forever. Elsewhere on campus are reminders of just how much time has passed since 1968, like the overgrown ruins of a track that was once home to a team and a movement. Tommy Smith was raised in Lemoore, California, the seventh of 12 kids who would spend mornings and weekends working in cotton and grape fields with their father. I was good at pain. You work in those cotton fields as a kid, uh, you will get used to pain. Not that you liked it, but you will certainly get used to it and you have to endure that feeling. Smith's talents earned him an occasional break from the field. Dad told me, he said, boy, I'll let you go to this meet. But if you take second place, you'll be back in the fields next Saturday with the rest of your brothers and sisters. So that was certainly an incentive to never take second. Smith earned a scholarship to San Jose State, where his teammate was Lee Evans. As a boy, Evans had worked in the same cotton fields as Smith. And by 1966, they were the two biggest stars of a program that had come to be known as Speed City. Tom Rizzo is a very quiet, reserved guy. You know, he was two years ahead of me, so I was this sophomore kid trying to keep up with him. We always had a lot of fun. Half a century ago, Lee Evans could run a single lap around a track faster than anyone alive. He received two new knees last year, but his old ones had carried him to a 400-meter world record that stood for 20 years. Meanwhile, with his long, easy stride, 
Tommy Smith broke the 200-meter world record as a junior at San Jose State. Smith begins to pour it on and forges to the front. He literally flies toward the tape. On occasion, Coach Bud Winter would race Smith and Evans against one another. No one has never passed me with 50 meters to go in the race. So I said to myself, if I beat him to the 150, I want to beat this guy because I always have a good finish. Man. <laughs> At about 150, you know, I saw, I saw a knee about this high. When it came down, he was eight meters in front of me. Tommy, no, he don't spend no time next to you. <laughs> Speed City became an object of fascination, luring journalists and camera crews from around the world. I prefer the 200 meters, though. Je préfère le 200 mètres à toutes les autres. But for the athletes, especially the black athletes, a taste of fame didn't make them impervious to an empty stomach. We were hungry all the time. You know, because there was no money. My scholarship was uh, $85 a month, and my rent was $80, so I had $5 left over. That's what we went through back in the 60s, man. Smith enrolled in the ROTC. He was a self-described follower of rules, a mild-mannered social science major, and a graceful athlete a contrast in every way to an arriving transfer from East Texas State. A young man who grew up in Harlem and swept into Speed City like a storm of swagger and fury. His name was John Carlos. He had this New York walk. I said, that's a cool walk that guy got, because I was in the straight guy, six feet four to stick. And he said, I heard that uh, San Jose State had blowing a lot of smoke about speed, but I came here to bring the fire. And I looked at him, I said, oh, this guy's bad. I don't look at myself as being cocky as much as I looked at myself as being assured as to who I was and what my ability was. Some guys, I would look at them and tell them, say, hey, man, make sure you be close to me so you be in the picture. I don't know if you've ever seen a rock coming at you <laughs> at full speed in your face and you can't move. That's like being a for John Carlos. So either you have to get out of the way or outrun the rock. And uh, I had no intention of getting out of anybody's way. They had to run over me. But it wasn't the intimidating John Carlos or world record holder Tommy Smith who was the most commanding presence on campus. That distinction belonged to a six foot eight inch former San Jose State discus thrower and basketball player named Harry Edwards. I personally, as an individual, have applied for immediate acceptance into the Black Panther Party. Edward sought to bring together athletes in the fight to end racial injustice. Among Edward's early disciples were the Speed City trio of Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and Lee Evans, three of America's best sprinters who found themselves at the center of a blazing controversy after they promised to boycott the Mexico City Olympics. We're gonna do what we're going to do, regardless of the white folks believe us or not. We're not talking about a few medals. We're not talking about the Olympics. We're not out to destroy the United States and the Olympics. We're talking about human rights. As a student, Harry Edwards had seen firsthand the inequality between white and black athletes. Now teaching at his alma mater, Edwards wanted to bring together athletes to call attention to the discrimination felt by black Americans. It was called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. What was going on at San Jose State was going on at all of these so-called integrated schools. They had us in the locker room. We could go on the field, but we couldn't become head coach. We couldn't become a college professor. It never dawned on them that the athletes that they brought in might one day want to be the athletic director at their alma mater. You come in, you play football, and then you go back to wherever you came from, make room for the next Negro. Harry is a courageous individual uh, that wanted to make change and was willing to sacrifice everything to make the change. So, you know, they looked at Harry as a villain, but then they looked at each and every one of us as a villain, like we wanted to disrupt the party, so to speak. In the year leading up to the Olympics, the most outspoken black athlete in America was Muhammad Ali. After refusing to serve in the Vietnam War, Ali was stripped of his heavyweight title belt. My intention is to box, to win a clean fight. But in war, the intention is to kill, 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 and continue killing innocent people. 
In June 1967, Jim Brown invited several top black athletes to Cleveland to offer Ali their support. I always considered myself a friend of Harry's and a compadre, and that we were working towards the same ends. Alongside such established stars as Brown and Bill Russell was 20-year-old UCLA sophomore Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor. Harry Edwards was a, a brilliant man who uh, kept us aware of what we needed to uh, protest. You know, there were things that we needed to complain about because we weren't being treated right. Dr. Edwards was great at pointing out what was going on and not letting the people who were, who were doing these things uh, escape. Seeing these influential black athletes band together, Edwards was inspired to a similar action to bring national attention to the movement. His idea, a boycott of the Olympic Games. Being a student of sport and society, I began to think about that. What could we do? What would we do if we had an opportunity to leverage sport as a vehicle for change? In February 1968, Alcindor announced he would not try out for the Olympic team. Someone that popular and that great as an athlete to take the risk to come with us and to put his career in jeopardy when he has such a, you know, budding, great career. It was amazing for me, so I had a great admiration. With the best collegiate basketball player in the country boycotting the games, the Olympic Project for Human Rights received the attention they had sought. We're going to do what we're going to do, regardless of whether white folks believe us or not. You see what I'm saying? And that's boycott. I'm saying that we're going to do what is in the interest of black people, whatever it is. Let me say that I absolutely support this boycott. Dr. King was about nonviolence and quoting scripture. Harry Edwards wasn't quoting scripture. But Harry Edwards, I did think, had the right idea. He was trying to raise the level of consciousness about black athletes and whether they were getting appropriate rewards and respect. None of us probably had heard of Harry Edwards until that year. The word boycott created a hell of a stir. Perhaps just as surprising as Alcindor's boycott was the fact that the all-white Harvard rowing team, led by Paul Hoffman, contributed to the movement. When athletes started talking about the Olympics and combining them with the ideals of, certainly the ideals of racial equality, that connection was pretty easy for us to make. And it seemed to be one avenue where we could do something that was beyond just rowing. The Harvard University crew team invited me to come and speak to the student body and explain why we were doing the things we were doing and saying the things we were doing. What we decided to do after our press conference with Harry Edwards was simply write letters to each and every member of the team as they were selected. The letters were basically welcome to the team. We were enclosing some material about the Olympic project because our black teammates have raised some very important issues and we think there should be a dialogue about these. And that caused a stir. The cause was uniting athletes from different backgrounds in different parts of the country. But in 1968, many believed the Olympic Project for Human Rights to be a divisive effort led by disruptive men. For some, there would be consequences for supporting the movement. Ahead, as the athletes find their voice, the proposed boycott threatens to derail U.S. dominance at the Olympics. Jim Ryan has been taking victory laps for more than half a century. He was the first high schooler to break four minutes in the mile. On this day, he's being honored at the U.S. Track and Field Championships, a celebration of the world record he set in 1967. A new world record in the mile run. Ryan is the last American to be the world's fastest miler. He was big. Jim Ryan was big. He had that kind of well-scrubbed, all-American look about him. He was a huge deal. People could identify with this kid from Kansas and an American who was then setting records and became a world record holder. It was just a great opportunity to represent your country and, and be a role model for them. Let's hear it for Jim Ryan, the champion. 
1968, Bryant's clean-cut image offered a sharp contrast to the perceived disruptors who were threatening to boycott the Mexico City Olympics. I was hoping it wouldn't happen. I realized it was a right they had at the same time. You know, I needed to, as everyone did at that point, focus on what you were doing because you were there for a purpose uh, and you wanted to make sure when your moment came that you were ready to give your best performance. Ryan wasn't alone in hoping the boycott would go away. Prominent black athletes shared his concern about missing the Olympics. Let's say that in 1972, I don't make the team. Suppose I break a leg. Suppose something happens to me. So I, I have to be in the here and now. I made it up in my mind that if I was good enough to make an Olympic team, and my dream was to make an Olympic team, I wasn't going to let nobody interfere with my dream. The proposed boycott sought to highlight the inequality black Americans faced at home. But the Olympic Project for Human Rights also outlined several sports-specific goals, like the inclusion of more black coaches and officials in the United States Olympic Committee, the expulsion of South Africa and Southern Rhodesia from the Olympics due to apartheid policies, and the removal of IOC President Avery Brundage. He is totally unacceptable as the head of the Olympic Commission, uh, and we want him removed. The most important one was the fact that Avery Brundage was the chairman of the Olympic Committee, and he was the person who told the Jewish athletes in 1936 that they couldn't compete in the Berlin Olympics because it was going to make Hitler angry. In 1936, Brundage was the president of the U.S. Olympic Committee. He later became chairman of the IOC in 1952. Targeting him was a bold step for the movement. I don't think any of these boys will be foolish enough to demonstrate at the Olympic Games. And I think if they do, they will be promptly sent home. I'm not a boy. I'm a man. I'm an American. Army Captain Mel Pinder was serving in the 82nd Airborne Division in the Mekong Delta when the Army brought him home from Vietnam in 1967 so that he could train for the Olympics. You gonna call us boys because we're black? You don't call men b boys. I mean, they did that in the slavery days. I know I'm not a boy because I fought for my country. Even as Olympic trials got underway in June, the boycott dominated the conversation. What would they have to do for you to go to Mexico? The boycott is still on. At this point, the boycott is still on. No other point. No other comments. The consequences of a boycott were magnified by the potential of a track and field team that was starting to look like it could be the greatest in Olympic history. Trials began in Los Angeles, where several athletes wore pins in support of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. For Tommy Smith and John Carlos, controversy followed. In the 200 meters, the two outspoken runners advanced to the next round of trials, despite being given the most disadvantageous lanes. They knew that Tommy Smith was not a front runner. They took him and put him out of lane eight. They knew that I was injured. They put me in lane one. So their attitude was to knock us out. Race officials stated the draw was random, but Smith didn't buy it. In 1968, Olympic trials for the men were held in two parts. Ten weeks after the field was narrowed in Los Angeles, the team reconvened in Echo Summit, California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. There, athletes would encounter a similar elevation to what they would face in Mexico City. The top three finishers in each event would make the Olympic team. The track was built just for trials. And for the athletes, it was unlike anywhere they had ever competed before. This is what's left of the old track. We'd run by this tree. I remember this grandfather tree here. Dick Fosbury was here in 1968. He was a young high jumper who was turning heads, and that year, he forever changed his event. The style for the high jump that was used by 95% of the athletes was called the Western Roller, the straddle technique. I was a failure with the style that everybody else used. At a high school meet in 1963, Fosbury decided to try something new. I was the worst guy in the entire 
uh, district, and I knew I had to do something different. With his signature flop, Fosbury was the third and final Olympic qualifier at Echo Summit. Between jumps, he had an up-close look at the competition. The start of the 200 meters was back on the corner in the trees. You'd hear the gun come off, and then you couldn't see anything until they came out of the trees. In the 200 meters, John Carlos emerged from the forest ahead of Tommy Smith in the fastest time ever run. Lee Evans broke the world record in the quarter mile. 22-year-old Bob Beeman won the long jump by nearly half a foot. And in the 1500, Jim Ryan fought through the rare air to qualify for his second Olympics. It was a roster simmering with potential and also a group that had successfully lobbied for change. By the time the U.S. team was named, some of the demands of the Olympic Project for Human Rights had been met. South Africa and Southern Rhodesia were banned from the games, and there would be black coaches on the Olympic team that year. Those games, coupled with the lack of unanimous support among black athletes, led Harry Edwards to call off the boycott that had been promised for months. And the conversation shifted to raising awareness in Mexico City. I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, is the boycott itself dead now? Is that finished? I, I would say the boycott is off. Now, what about other things that might happen in Mexico City? All I can say is uh, you can expect almost anything. While Mexico City today is a vibrant modern capital of more than 20 million people, awarding the 1968 Olympics to Mexico City was a bold and controversial decision. In many eyes, Mexico was still a third world country. On arrival, the United States team gets a typical full-blooded Mexican bienvenido. And from Chico to the champions, a big ole. La imagen de México en general antes de los Juegos era una imagen de gente irresponsable, floja y de que dormía la siesta con un gran sombrero recargado en un nopal. Mexico, you know, are they going to be able to organize an event this magnitude? So we were kind of hurt because of that. And it was a great opportunity to show what we Mexicans can do. It would be the first time the games were held in a Spanish-speaking country. Mexico was a young democracy with a booming economy. It was called the Mexican miracle. The 60s was a good decade for the Mexican people. For the first time, universities were booming. But there were many Mexicans who felt the Mexican miracle had left them behind. That sentiment helped lead to massive student protests throughout the summer of 1968. The government so far has done little, if anything, to settle the student problem. It has simply tried to clamp a lid on and keep everything out of sight. But by threatening to disrupt the Olympic Games, the students themselves may bring harsher measures against them. Nine miles north of Mexico City's Olympic Stadium is the neighborhood of Tlate Loco in the Plaza of Three Cultures, which lies next to Aztec ruins more than 700 years old. On this day, the Mexican flag here flies at half-mast, commemorating the September 2017 earthquake that reduced to rubble the 500-year-old bell tower of the Church of Santiago. The plaza is home to centuries of history. But just 50 years ago, it was the site of one of Mexico's most tragic days. October 2nd, 1968, just 10 days before the games, roughly 8,000 demonstrators assembled in the plaza. Students in Mexico City began a new protest this afternoon. They're demanding the immediate release of other students jailed after rioting earlier this year. Mexico's president, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, had grown concerned that the student protest movement was a threat to Mexico's ability to host a civilized Olympics. There were all sorts of rumors going around, floating around, that something is going to happen in Tlatelolco. 
What actually happened at Tlate Loco has been debated for decades. But declassified documents first released in 1998 told this story. Army troops advanced through the Aztec ruins and surrounded the demonstrators. Those troops didn't know that members of a separate elite army unit called the Presidential General Staff took elevated positions in nearby buildings. Acting on orders from President Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, the gunmen opened fire on both protesters and troops below. The ground troops, who thought the protesters had opened fire, responded with lethal force. But now the troops are coming. You can hear what it sounds like. According to those documents, it was a calculated plan orchestrated to make it appear that civilians had incited the violence and provide President Diaz Ordaz with a justifiable reason to quiet the protests. They're letting go with just about everything they have. The other troops have swept across the plaza. They killed whoever, they didn't care, and that justified the government to occupy and detain and, and crush the movement. The government initially reported that 20 people died that day. Later, accounts suggested numbers in the hundreds. Meanwhile, a newly created police force called the Olympica Brigada detained more than a thousand of the protesters. And the government painted a sanitized version of recent events as visitors began arriving for the games. As you drove in from the airport, to the Olympic Village, you noticed all these shacks along the highway gleaming in the sun. They had all just been whitewashed. And I remember the same whitewash on the cobblestones in the plaza. We kind of scraped away some of it, and it was brown underneath. And of course, what it was was these were the bloodstains uh, of where they had been murdered. And uh, their blood was still there. I declare open the Olympic Games of Mexico, celebrating the 19th Olympiad of the modern era. The Olympics began 10 days later, without mention of the massacre at Tolate Loco. While that ugly subtext was largely ignored, the games themselves would otherwise exceed expectations for the host nation and it opened with a gesture that was ahead of its time when hurdler Enriqueta Basilio became the first woman to light the Olympic cauldron. It was because of a woman, and we were proud of that. We were showing everybody that in Mexico, women had, had the same chances as men. And we were so proud. I still get kind of a goosebumps, you know, around my body, remember those moments. Felipe Munoz delivered another proud moment for the host nation. He was just 17 years old and had grown up just 10 blocks from the Olympic pool. A decided underdog, Munoz won the 200-meter breaststroke. It was the first gold medal at the Olympic Games for a Mexican athlete. I felt that we needed that. We were doing great. We did great. I remember the flags. Did you see the Mexican flag in the middle, the Soviet Union and the American flag right next to it? The two superpowers right next to Mexico. So that makes us very proud. All Mexicans are very proud because of that. There were many reasons for Mexicans to be proud of their Olympics. The event was welcoming and well organized. The sight of a woman lighting the cauldron provided a progressive and iconic image. And in Felipe Munoz, they had a homegrown Olympic champion. But the pressure for Mexico to prove it could deliver such triumphs was at the very root of the tragedy at Tolate Loco 10 days earlier. The games would be a success, but the price had been steep. Ahead, the Civil Rights Movement and the Cold War come to Mexico City, embodied by two brave podium protests. The moment many people have been anxiously awaiting 
here at the Olympic Stadium in Mexico City has arrived. The final of the men's 100 meters. Every Olympics answers an age-old question. Who is the fastest man alive? There's the gun, there's the start. Watch lanes one and three, Green and Hines. In 1968, it was Jim Hines. It appears to be Jim Hines of the United States, the winner of the men's 100 meter sprint. The 100 meters was the first event in which a black American was expected to win gold. Even though he was against the boycott, Jim Hines had made it clear that he would not shake the hand of IOC President Avery Brundage if Brundage was the one handing out the 100-meter medals. Well, I was one of the athletes who had agreed to not shake hands with Brundage. We didn't want him to put the medals around us. Brundage did not hand out the 100-meter medals as planned. It was early confirmation that sport and politics would intersect at the games. Vera Cheslovska was one of Czechoslovakia's most popular athletes. Four years earlier, the gymnast had won the individual all-around title at the Tokyo Olympics. In Mexico City, the 26-year-old repeated as all-around champion. There's no doubt in the minds of this audience who is the reigning queen of gymnastics. It's Vera Cheslovska. But Chasovska's performance in 1968 had even more significance because of what she had left behind in Czechoslovakia. For most of 1968, a conflict simmered between Chasovska's home country and the neighboring Soviet Union. Czechoslovakian leader Alexander Dubček had promoted the decentralization of the economy and lifted restrictions on the media, travel, and free speech. It was an awakening to individual freedoms that came to be known as the Prague Spring, and it did not sit well with Moscow, where it was seen as an affront to their power and influence in the region. NBC News presents a special report on the invasion of Czechoslovakia. On August 20th, less than two months before the start of the Mexico City Olympics, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. Russia and her Warsaw Pact allies have sent troops and tanks to put an end to the democratization of the nation. Milena Dukova, a Czechoslovakian diver, was 16 years old at the time. I had to walk between tanks and machine guns and saw things I never wanted to see before or after or ever. I was afraid, so it was scary. In addition to being one of Czechoslovakia's most beloved athletes, Cheslovska was also an outspoken critic of Soviet-style communism and the Soviet invasion of her country, which made her a target. To avoid arrest, Cheslovska left her home in Prague and trained for the Olympics in secret in the mountain town of Schumperk. Tak v tom momentu já jsem vlastně byla, dá by se říci, bez rukou i bez nohou, protože jsem to nářadí neměla. Ale tak, jak si každý Čechoslovák umí. Among Česlovská's chief Soviet competitors was Natalia Kuchinskaya. No, ještě, ta, no, jak to, nás bylo málo informací z toho strany. Informace byla toka ze strany SSR. Oni řekli, že lidé poprosili nás zajít a pomoct jim s tankami. The fans in Mexico City sympathized with the Czechoslovakian athletes. Porque veíamos las imágenes de los checoslovacos enfrentándose sin armas a los tanques rusos. En la ceremonia de inauguración, el, la segunda delegación más aplaudida fue Checoslovaquia. We were definitely treated very special, especially Vera. They really loved her. She was a great athlete. She was beautiful. She was blonde. She was just their darling. Two days after Cheslovska won all-around gold, her success continued in the individual apparatus finals. After she won gold on vault and bars, a sweep of the individual gold medals was not out of the question. I was in that moment a representative of all Czechoslovak pokořených. Tak já jsem věděla, já jsem věděla, že nemůžu jinak než vyhrát. 
Относительно бревна, относительно всего была Вера Чеславская. Я ей говорю, хай, Вера, она вот так вот то же самое делала, поворачивала голову. For the Soviet Union, the most successful and influential program in the world, a Cheslavska sweep would have been simply unacceptable. On the balance beam, a controversial judging decision put Kuchinskaya in first place, leaving Cheslavska with silver. Vlastně tak nějak zapracovali, protože už se mi to zdálo příliš mnoho, že by jedna sportovkyně měla všech pět zlatých. Takže tam udělali takový kompromis a tu zlatou medaili dali té sovětské závodnici. Immediately afterward, on floor, it appeared that Cheslavska had won gold. But judges retroactively adjusted preliminary scores of her Soviet competitor, Larissa Petrick, which led to a tie for first. The official had corrected the previous score of Larissa Petrick and have announced that it is a tie for the gold medal. This is, without question, one of the most dramatic moments of this Olympiad. Both times on the podium, when the Soviet anthem played, Cheslavska looked away. Now, this is a highly emotional moment. We're going to hear the Russian national anthem and watch Vera Kozlavska. When she was on the stage of the Soviet flag, she was like that. Mě defiloval zpětně před očima všechno, co se stalo toho 21. srpna. Já jsem prostě toho byla plná, jako celá naše země. A... By the end of the games, Cheslavska had won six medals, four of them gold. It was the greatest individual performance by a female gymnast in that era. The very next day, Cheslavska married fellow Olympian Joseph Odlozil in Mexico City. Mexicans poured in by the thousands to catch a glimpse of Cheslavska. Los casó el arzobispo de México y fue declarada, digamos, en ese momento la novia de México. Cheslavska's protest shined a light on the Soviet Union, pushing past its borders a sliver of the Cold War playing out in Mexico City. For Americans tuning in, there was another protest that stoked tensions at home, as the games became a global stage for the civil rights movement. For the first time in U.S. television history, the Olympics were available live and in color in 1968. American audiences were treated to one of the finest U.S. team performances. The United States topped the medal table with gold medals in boxing, there it is. diving, equestrian, and sail. No team won more than the American swimmers, as the U.S. collected 21 gold medals, 52 overall. The United States makes a clean sweep and 16-year-old Debbie Meyer became the first female swimmer to win three individual gold medals at an Olympic Games. In basketball, a group of unheralded college players pulled off one of the upsets of the games. The U.S. men went undefeated against much older and experienced teams, defeating Yugoslavia in the final. Leading the way was the team's youngest player, Trinidad State Junior College Center, Spencer Haywood, who had been against the idea of a boycott from the beginning. And there's the end of the game, there it goes. So the United States get their seventh Olympic medal. When you have all that strike going on in your hometown and you're away in another country, you only have each other to lean on. And we are leaning on the flag. We don't know anything about race. We don't know anything about color. We just know one thing, red, white, and blue. We want America to win, and that's what the Olympics is all about. The Americans prevailed without the National Player of the Year and Lou Alcindor. I didn't regret my choice. I was glad I made the choice I did, and I was ready to live with it. But, you know, I think that what I did accomplish was raising people's consciousness, and to me, that's worth more than a gold medal. Tommy Smith and John Carlos had been two of the most prominent athletes at the center of the Olympic Project for Human Rights and the threat of an Olympic boycott. 
But on October 16, 1968, they were in Mexico City preparing for the semifinals of the 200 meters. John Carlos advanced after a strong challenge from Australian Peter Norman. While Smith's Olympics nearly ended before the final. Four steps after the race, I had a devastating pain in the left groin. And I had thought I had been shot because it was a piercing feeling. And I said, oh, man, I mean, why did they shoot me there? I looked down, there was no blood, so I knew I had to pull the muscle. Tommy limped away after the semifinal. I went down to the warm-up track. I said, Tommy, are you OK? And he winked at me. Then I looked at John. John was laying on his back, just talking to everybody, you know. Um, I said, oh, OK. Tommy got John in his pocket. He don't even know it. Tommy Smith having a groin muscle pull? Fake, artificial. He didn't fool me in the least bit. Tommy, from my perspective, wanted to play a hit game. Smith had just two hours to recover for the final. He would line up in lane three with Carlos just to his outside in lane four. Smith was the world record holder but Carlos had defeated Smith at Olympic trials. This is Tommy Smith. He strained a groin muscle in the semifinal. Whether he's ready or not, nobody really knows. All the other athletes were warming up, but I could not warm up because I was afraid if I warm up, I might pull the muscle. Let me pull it coming out of the blocks. It's a good start. And Carlos, as usual, has burst out of the blocks. John Carlos always has a great start. Tommy Smith running pretty well so far. I was in fourth place mid-turn. I was in trouble. It's John Carlos right now. It's Carlos and Smith. Yeah, pull the throttle. All the way out. And here comes Tommy Smith. Smith has done it with his hands in the air. I think Norman of Australia lean to beat John Carlos. Tommy Smith won gold in world record time. Australian Peter Norman finished second. John Carlos took bronze. After the race, first thing and foremost that jumped to my mind is now we can get busy. Let's get it on. That was my attitude. Let's do what I came here to do. While Smith and Carlos knew they wanted to make a statement on the podium, they found an unlikely ally joining their cause at the last minute. I was probably more happy for Peter Norman that day than I was for Tommy Smith or John Carlos. And he is a white guy that ran 20 flat. I ain't never seen no white guy run like that. Tommy and I started making the suggestion as to what we were going to do. Peter was looking on, and he kind of inquired, what are you guys doing? And he said, man, we're getting ready to make a statement. And I said, would you like to win an Olympic project for human rights button? And he said, yeah, and he's kind of reaching for mine, and I had to smack him on his hand. Oh, I'll get you one. You can't have this one. Paul Hoffman, one of the Harvard rowers who had been an early supporter of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, happened to be seated nearby with the wives of Smith and Carlos. Peter Norman looks up at me and, and he said, hey mate, you got another one of those buttons. I said, you gonna wear it out there? He said, yeah. I said, well, wear it out there. Here, I have mine. And I handed it to him. Peter Norman was a man's man. And I always have respect and admiration for him as long as I live and after that. With Norman on their side, Smith and Carlos settled on their own symbols. They wore black socks with no shoes, signifying endemic poverty at home. Beads around Carlos's neck reflecting the history of lynching in America. Smith wore a black scarf, while Carlos wore a black t-shirt, covering the USA on his race uniform. And earlier that day, Tommy Smith's wife had brought one pair of black leather gloves to the stadium. Smith took the right, Carlos the left. As the anthem began, they raised their fists together. The most important thing was the reality of these black athletes banding together, making a stand against a system that did not represent black people. The 
and put the glove on to let them know that, yes, we're here representing America, we're here representing the Olympics, but we're here more folk representing black people and black pride. I didn't think anything was wrong. And then the people around us start booing and, booing and whistling. The boos were about as profound as the silence was when we raised our fists and bowed our heads in prayer. And they're both devastating. Do you think the Olympic Games are the right place to do this kind of thing? You ought to use this as a world stage. We used this so the whole world could see the poverty of the black man in America. The I might say that you've got it all. You've got publicity, you've got medals, you've always you've got martyrdom as well. What are yeah. you going to say to that? I can't eat that, and the kids around my block, they grew up with me, they can't eat it. And the kids that's going to grow up after them, they can't eat publicity, they can't eat gold medals, as Tommy Smith said. All we ask for is an equal chance to be a human being. The Black Power disciples, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the Olympic 200 meters gold and bronze medalists, had been suspended by the United States Olympic Committee and given 48 hours to leave Mexico. I had said that if there were any demonstrations at the Olympic Games by anyone, the participants would be sent home. To discourage further protests, IOC President Avery Brundage enlisted Jesse Owens to deliver a message to a gathering of American track and field athletes. Then they said, well, we got to find somebody to tame these guys. Then they said, oh, well, let's go find Jesse Owens. They found Jesse, cleaned him up, put him in a suit, stuck some money in his pocket, and gave him a script to read. To me, politics has no part to play on the field of strife of competition. I've never believed it. Owens was a hero to many in that room. At the 1936 Olympics, Owens' four gold medals were a powerful rebuke to the Nazi vision for the Berlin Olympics. But Owens also represented a cautionary tale. He never made a living as a track athlete and turned to stunts like competing against racehorses to get by. Owens told the athletes in Mexico City that if they used the Olympics to make a statement, they wouldn't be able to get jobs when they returned home. He came in and said, but we wasn't getting no jobs. And, and I made it clear, Jesse, we don't have no jobs now. And it made it clear to him also, Jesse, ain't nobody heard from you from 1936 until today. And you're here as a result of what we're doing today. If we hadn't we done anything there, you'd still be buried. So we kind of booed Jesse out of the room. He had tears. But he was on the wrong side at the wrong time. The day after the Owens meeting, Smith and Carlos were sent home. Newsmen tried to get comment from Lee Evans, the sprinter. There have been rumors that Evans is sympathetic to the protesters. ABC's Ray Falk couldn't get any comment either seconds. from the wife of sprinter John Carlos. And Carlos personally told newsmen to keep away. Look around. I'm pretty pissed off already with a lot of white people. So leave me alone, OK? I'm asking you the last time. Next man come up and put a camera in my face, or uh, speak up in my face, I'm going to knock him down and jump on him, yeah? Now, believe me, I'm telling you, if you know what's good, go out and see if you can talk to one of the coaches. Just leave me alone, all right? Two days after the 200 meters, Lee Evans set a world record and led a U.S. sweep of the 400. It's going to be an American one, two, three. And Lee Evans dying up, he puts his feet. On the podium, all three men wore black berets in support of the Black Panther Party. However, when the anthem began, the men removed their hats. Evans would later say that his protest made enemies on both sides. While many white people were upset about the beret, many black people were mad that he took it off. He was an Olympic gold medalist and returned home feeling overlooked and unappreciated. Well, for me, it was mixed, you know, because, oh, how can I do what Tommy and John did? 
Oh, you know, you didn't get kicked off the team. And so I had to tell guys, if you want to get kicked off the team, you should have made the team and did it yourself. So it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't easy for me. Are you sorry now? Well, the action you took? The goal of the Olympic Project for Human Rights had been to bring awareness to racial injustice. What began as a small student movement at San Jose State earned the attention of the watching world in Mexico City. Next, the U.S. track and field team makes a statement, and Bob Beeman sets a record that even those who saw it could not believe. The 1968 Mexico City Olympics delivered several enduring images. A woman lighting the cauldron, the defiant protest of a Czech gymnast, and the silent, powerful gesture of two American sprinters. Tommy Smith and John Carlos were sent home for their protests, but their medals added to the tally for a U.S. track and field team that would prove to be the greatest ever assembled. It's Tyus. Wyoming Tyus has defended her gold medal. So Al Arda has done it for the fourth consecutive time. Olympic champion in the discus with a new Olympic record. Our congratulations to you. Thank you very much, Al. He's got good speed. He's got good position. He made it. He made it. Adeline Manning really pouring it on. Look at this girl go. To me, the Olympic gold medalist in the one that separates the men from the boys, the decathlon. Situated more than 7,300 feet above sea level, Mexico City remains the highest point of elevation in which the summer games have ever taken place. Thin air means less wind resistance, and sprinters thrive. In nine sprint events, eight world records were broken, seven by American athletes. But distance runners, not used to the altitude, suffered. Altitude was a problem. Altitude was going to be the great uh, unknown, so to speak. Jim Ryan grew up in the cornfields of Kansas, where the elevation was just over 1,000 feet. His principal rival in the 1500, Kip Kano, had spent his entire life in the Kenyan Highlands at an elevation more than 5,000 feet higher. Kip Chogi Kino, can Jim Ryan catch him? Kip Chogi Kino racing for the wire. Jim Ryan in second spot. It's going to be Kip Chogi Kino's race, and what a block win on his face. Jim Ryan finishes in second spot. I finished much faster than anybody ever thought a sea level runner could run. And to me, it still remains as one of my best races ever. In the field events, Dick Fosbury captivated the crowd, winning high jump gold with his revolutionary flop. Osprey has a rather interesting approach, and there's the back of the floor. When we first saw him, we said, oh, man, what a nutcase here <laughs> with this guy. I've seen some unorthodox styles of jumping before, and none of them panned out. Here he comes, bends around to the bar, up. Over! He's over! And the stadium just erupted. People were celebrating, and they'd never seen this before, and it was really just an amazing experience. His victory was a revelation. Every high jump gold medal after 1972 has been won with the Fosbury flop. But the most astonishing performance in Mexico City and one of the greatest feats in the history of sports came in the men's long jump from a precocious 22-year-old from Queens, New York. I was always the youngster that was coming along that if he ever hit the board right, God knows what he might do. I made sure that I had all the ingredients ready. I had cooked them up, put them all together, so my mind was actually set to, to do what I had to do at that moment. Bob was a 9-3 sprinter. He could run with me or John or Lee, so I knew that something was about to happen. Most long jumpers take a few jumps to find their groove, but Beeman needed only one. Nineteen sixty Olympic champion Ralph Boston immediately recognized this significance. He was like, it's over. I said, well, what's over? It's over. The long jump, Bob just just jumped out the pit. 
Beeman had jumped so far that the electronic measuring system could not reach his mark. They had to go to Ace Hardware <laughs> and look for the measuring tape <laughs> to, to actually do it the manual way. And then all of a sudden I heard over the speaker, ladies and gentlemen, the world record has just been crushed by Bob Beeman. Bob Beeman with that tremendous jump, 29 feet, 2 and 1 half inches, broke the existing world record by 1 foot 9 and 3 quarter inches. There was a lot of commotion. I was enjoying in that moment, I think I was between time and space. Later that day at the medal ceremony, Beeman stepped onto the podium with his pants rolled up to reveal black socks. Ralph Boston, the bronze medalist, stood barefoot. Another podium, another silent protest amid athletic success. Beeman, though, is not remembered for his socks, but for his leap. It was an astonishing jump that broke the world record by nearly two feet. As one writer put it, it was as if the first astronaut had skipped past the moon and landed on Mars. They have been scientists, they have been psychologists. In terms of coming to some kind of conclusion, how that happened, sometimes there's no conclusion other than he did it. The last American individual gold medal in Mexico City went to a punishing boxer named George Foreman. Headlines at home had been dominated by Carlos and Smith's podium protest. So the image of a victorious heavyweight fighter waving a small American flag was seen by some as a rebuttal of the perceived un-American actions of other black athletes in Mexico City. I've never been in the armed forces. First chance I had to wear red, white, and blue. And I wanted the whole world to know that, look, this is my country. Look at, look at what I've done. And I wanted to spit it out. I wish I'd had two flags at that time. George, he didn't go out there with the flag to denounce anyone. George went out there with pride in the fact that he won, and he won for America. The 16 days in Mexico City were thrilling and unforgettable, but also transformative. In a year when the world was on fire, the game shined a light on conflict raging at home and abroad and produced the era's defining image of change. The Olympic cauldron was extinguished on October 27th. The games would never be the same. For the past several summers, Tommy Smith has held camps for young athletes. How you doing, youngster? This day, the Tommy Smith Youth Track Meet is being run just outside the nation's capital. Meanwhile, John Carlos serves as an ambassador for USA Track and Field. 50 years ago, days like these would have been impossible for them to imagine. In the wake of their protests, Smith and Carlos were outcasts. I just want to get away from the uh, reporters and so forth right now and give me some rest. And my wife is very tired also. I'm sure she is. I'm sure Tommy and his wife are very tired also. How about this afternoon, though, later on? You think we can set something up? No, not, not this afternoon. Yeah. Not this afternoon. I, I went through all deal all week, and all four of us went through all deal all week, and I don't care to talk, and I don't believe they care to talk now for a while. In the press, they were vilified. Brent Musburger, then a columnist for the Chicago American, called them black-skinned stormtroopers, saying their protest was juvenile and ignoble. And in the mail, a barrage of harassing letters, racist taunts, and death threats. Most were phone calls or letters. You will die if you continue, or niggas are cheap anyway, so your debt will be easily paid. I was afraid to walk in the house. Uh, I was afraid to go to school. I was just afraid. Returning home, it's a whole new life, a whole new thing. 
opportunities on the track were few, job offers even fewer. Both fathers, Smith and Carlos, struggled to support their families. Couldn't find a job, I was sitting at home. All the promises before I went to Mexico City, all the promises, a plethora of promises, fell through. Nobody called me, nobody knocked on my door to say, Tommy, we're here to help you. No friends, nothing, I was just sitting there. Me and a hungry wife and a hungry little son. For John Carlos, the struggle tore his family apart. In 1977, his first wife, Kim, took her own life. My wife sacrificed herself as a result of what was happening to us, how the government did us, how everybody shut down us. You know when you got a lack of money in your household, and your woman, you know what it creates? It creates friction. And my wife got to the point where she felt like the only way I can get away from this is to take my life. As Carlos and Smith struggled in the years after 1968, they saw George Foreman become heavyweight champion of the world. Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! And later earn a fortune selling his namesake grills. Great tasting, healthier food in minutes. For his conquest and flag waving in Mexico City, Foreman received an invitation to the White House. In contrast to Smith and Carlos, he was portrayed as a grateful champion, an image Foreman embraced. They have a thing going around, they call, uh, what is it? Oh yeah, black power, you know, great. This is good, it's, you know, you say black power, but I got another thing I want to introduce to all of you. I'll put this down for a minute. It's like this, people power. <laughs> John Carlson and Tommy Smith, they had gone through college, and a lot of college kids had a lot of things they were aware of that we were not. So when they got up on the platform and did the clinch fists and all of that, it was just another event until I saw him. I looked out my window in the Olympic Village, and they were escorting him off the village. That broke my heart. A lot of black people came up from what Tommy Smith, John Carlson, Peter Norman did. Then near one of them sent a dime. Not so much to send a dime for me, but for my kids. Help them get a meal. Because you knew I couldn't do it. But then George sent me a letter, brought tears to my eyes, and he said to my brother, John Collins, he said, from your brother, George Farmer, the biggest and the baddest cowboy you know, I want to do what I can do to help you, John. And when he sent it, man, I looked at it, I said, I can't take this. George was the best dude in the world with a big heart. He had it then, he have it now. For Carlos and Smith, a hard truth since Mexico City is that they haven't always had each other to lean on. Their relationship is complicated. We have different attitudes about situations. He's not afraid to say anything, anytime, anywhere to anybody. <laughs> I'm just the opposite. One dispute that has lingered stems from Carlos's insistence that he let Smith win. Anyone can tell you, you say, man, Carlos won a whole bunch of medals, but he would never go home with him. He'd give them to the girls. I made the decision in my mind that I was gonna let Tommy have this race. You know, races don't mean nothing to me, the medals don't mean nothing to me, and it mean everything to him. John sometimes says that he run because he was born to run, or he run because that's what he does. Not so much to get the medal. I'm almost the opposite. I run to win and give me my medal. And we have to be that way because if we change it, we'll be living a lie. And I do not want to live a lie. And uh, I don't think John does either. Whatever drives them apart, the gravity of what they did together inevitably brings them back in orbit of one another. We're honored to have here the legendary Tommy Smith and John Carlos here today. It took almost half a century, but Smith and Carlos finally got their invitation to the White House at the request of the first black president. The, the, the powerful silent protest uh, in the 1968 games was controversial, but it woke folks up and created greater opportunity uh, for those that followed. A short walk from the White House, 
on the National Mall among monuments to founding fathers and fallen soldiers is the Museum of African American History and Culture. It opened in 2016, and the sports exhibit resides on the third floor. It begins in 1968. Welcome to your home. Thank you, Dr. Bunch. Thank good you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Always good to see you. What a treat. Yes, you know, this has become the Instagram moment in the museum. Everybody wants to make sure that they have their picture taken in front of this statue. I thought this was one of the most important moments of the 20th century, and I wanted it here. Everybody's trying to be you. Handsome young man. Oh, oh John? <laughs> <laughs> it's a short list of living people who can visit a statue of themselves. For Tommy Smith and John Carlos, what began at San Jose State now has a permanent home in the nation's capital. They stood silently together for 80 seconds. 50 years later, their voice is still heard. Every Olympics has its legacy. Mexico City delivered performances that wouldn't be outdone for generations. And protests that will be remembered even longer. After the games, Vera Cheslovska, the Czech gymnast who dominated rivals from the invading Soviet Union said, we all tried hard to win in Mexico because it would turn the eyes of the world on our unfortunate country. But after the Soviet occupation, the new government labeled her an unhealthy influence and she was barred from competing but when communism fell in Czechoslovakia in 1989, she was among the leaders to address a crowd of more than 300,000 in the same Prague Square that Soviet tanks rolled through 21 years earlier. <laughs> Cheslavska died in 2016. Felipe Munoz became a shining example of why the Olympics came to a place like Mexico City. When the 17-year-old became a hometown star and his life was forever changed, Munoz later became the head of the Mexican Olympic Committee and a congressman. The massacre at Talate Loco is also part of Mexico City's Olympic legacy. When President Gustavo Diaz Ordaz crushed a student protest to ensure the Olympics would go off smoothly 10 days later. Munoz recalls a conversation he had with President Diaz Ordaz after the games. The Mexican president invited me to his house and they asked him, hey, Mr. President, how bad the Tlatelolco, you know? He got up and he said, let me tell you something, an expression in Mexico, it's preferible que se derrame la gota a que te explote el vaso. You had to take the tough decision so the country wouldn't explode. He said, you're too young to, to understand this, but eventually you will. For many in the United States, though, the games are best remembered for what happened in track and field. Of course, one image stands out from the rest. A protest now remembered on the campus where a movement started. At San Jose State, the silver medal platform remains empty, so visitors can stand alongside Tommy Smith and John Carlos, just as Peter Norman did that night. They could have not raised the fist. They could have stood out there and accepted their medals to their own personal glory, but those two giants of men on that day told the world exactly where they stood and in a, in a way told the world exactly what they should be doing about it too. Norman died of a heart attack in 2006. Smith and Carlos were pallbearers at the funeral. 50 years ago, IOC President Avery Brundage declared that political statements had no place in the Olympics. Smith and Carlos raised their fists anyway and paid a price. I think the Olympics have to take a good look at themselves through the International Olympic Committee and the various national committees. Because to pretend that the Olympic Games are sports and not politics is a falsity. 
Even now, the sight of athletes making political statements results in intense controversy. But there is no debate that the legacy of Tommy Smith and John Carlos echoes with every athlete who seeks to find their voice. There's a direct line of ascent between the athletes who struggle for dignity and respect in the 1960s. Ali, Smith and Carlos, Bill Russell, Jim Brown, Kurt Flood, Arthur Ashe, and Tony Dungy hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. There's a direct line of ascent between those connections and Barack Obama being elected to the White House. Because if America doesn't believe that blacks have the capability, the ability, the intellectual political acuity to win a Super Bowl, they most certainly are not going to elect him to run the country. So did it have an impact? Absolutely. When we see LeBron James make a statement, when we see Colin Kaepernick make a statement, when we see Jerry Jones taking a knee, <laughs> arm in arm with his players, they're standing on the shoulders of giants. Two in particular, Tommy Smith and John Carlos.